So ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about the laws of influence. Uh, this training uh, happens in various places. Some people, when they do this training, they call it POP. They call it the psychology of persuasion or they call it principles of persuasion. Uh, some other people do it as, as rules of influence. Uh, whatever this course is done, usually they charge very well. Uh, the person who authored the book, uh, Robert Chiadini, uh, there's a book, Psychology of Persuasion. If you can lay hands on this book, we'll try and get it for those who are in the offline class uh, so that they can pay for it next week, uh, if you can find. But it was a book I was given in Harvard. I went for a course in Harvard, and I was given this book um, as, a, as a necessary study material. Uh, it's a very good book. Uh, somewhere on the top of the book, it says, for marketers, is among the most important is among the most important books written in the last 10 years. Okay? It's a phenomenal book. It's a book that you need to read if you have anything to do with marketing. And many of us here today are network marketers. Uh, some of us are marketing in various aspects of, of, of life and business as well. This is something that you need. This is something that will be very, very useful to you. Uh, so I'd like you to pay attention uh, and get involved with it. So, uh, so please, in, this, in the following uh, few minutes, I'm going to be sharing on this laws of influence. Uh, today is day one. So today we're going to do one of the laws. Uh, the book that we're reviewing is called The Psychology of Persuasion, The Thoughts by Robert B. Cialdini. So of course, all references, all topics go to this amazing guy who is a, who is a, you know, who is a, a sweet professor of some sort of... Uh, of, of influence. He has specialization in influence. He's done a lot of research, a lot of experiments, and we're going to glean from his experience and his learnings in the next few minutes. Okay, so this is what the curriculum will look like for the next six weeks. We're going to have, first of all, the rules. Uh, we're going to talk today about the weapons of influence and then the law of reciprocity. Uh, by next week, Saturday, we're doing the law of scarcity. By th three weeks from now, we'll do the law of social proof. And then we're going to get into the law of commitment and consistency. We'll get into the law of liking, and then we'll talk about the law of authority. Now, these laws are not just laws that are meant to be hanging in our minds or in our heads. They are laws that we can immediately apply in our business and we can see immediate growth by applying them. Some of the people in the class tonight have applied a few of these things in doing their business. Some of you have applied these things without knowing what exactly you are applying. Uh, the beauty of a law is sometimes you can fluke it, but once you know the law, you can always replicate it. Whatever it is that you did to achieve results can be done again and again and again, and you can have predictable results. So I'm going to talk about these laws. And this will be our template. Our template is we'll talk about uh, the law. So the cost structure will be the law, uh, case studies and characteristics that reinforce the law. And then we're going to talk about practical applications in our environment. And where I'm going to open up the conversation for all of us to participate uh, by simply raising our hands and then I would call your name and then you will unmute your mic and then you will share with us what you have to share with us. So we're going to have an interactive class of some sort, one person talking per time uh, so that we don't have noise on the recording. You can enjoy the beauty of doing this together, learning together by following these very basic principles. So we're going to talk about the law, we're going to talk about case studies, and we're going to talk about practical applications for environment. But today, because we have another topic before the law, uh, which is called weapons of influence, I'm going to talk about that first the weapons of influence. If you're looking at your screen, uh, I'm sure you can see in front of you weapons of influence. Uh, and what exactly is the idea behind this? The idea behind this that Robert Chiadini, when, uh, when he was Dr. Robert Chiadini, when he was doing his studies, uh, observed that, you know, there's a pattern, or what you call fixed action pattern that you find evident with animals, okay? With birds, with reptiles, with fishes. Uh, every, almost all the genre of animals have a fixed action pattern. Uh, that, they, that, they, that they follow. And usually either motivated by color, motivated by sound, motivated by a variety of things, there are essentially stereotypes and triggers that once you do A, B, C, an animal is likely to behave in a certain way. They're called fixed action, action patterns. And one of the ones I was studying is the fixed action, action pattern for turkeys and their babies or their chicks. And it's very simple. It says that if a turkey has chicks, the turkey is inspired to groom the chicks when the chicks make a particular kind of noise. Now, in trying to discover what exactly is the fixed action pattern for turkeys, they try to check what exactly makes the turkey take care of his young ones. And they did a variety of experiments. So they realized that it was a chip, 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 chip sound that the little turkeys make that makes the mother turkey groom them, clean them, play with them and all the rest. And they said, okay, good. So how, how, you know, how far can this go? So they said, okay, what if it's a turkey? and it's not making that noise. They did the experiment and they realized 
if the turkey is dumb and doesn't speak, then you probably won't, the mother won't groom it. I said, okay, good. What if we stuff a turkey and make it look like a turkey but no sound? What will the mother do? And of course, nothing happened. Um, it didn't take care of the one that didn't make no sound. I said, what if we take a turkey, make it look like a turkey, stuff it with a radio recorder and play the same sound? And it was discovered that when you stuff the radio recorder with the sound of a chip, chip, chip of a baby turkey, the mother turkey will take care of the turkey. And I said, okay, no, let's see how far this can stretch. What if we look for what is normally the arch enemy of a turkey, a pole cat. If they put a pole cat in the turkey's nest, the turkey will destroy the pole cat. And they tried that out, the turkey destroyed, you know, was aggressive with the pole cat, you know, attacked the pole cat. And I said, okay, good. So let's make a stuffed pole cat and let's see the response. Stuffed pole cat, same response. And then they said, okay, let's take a stuffed pole cat and put the recorder inside the pole cat that sounds like the turkey. Cheap, 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 like the turkey babies. And let's see if his mother will groom the pole cat. And exactly, the mother groomed the pole cat. So they realize that a turkey can be easily scammed, technically, by ensuring that whatever it was that had the chip, chip sound that the children make, you know, uh, the, the turkey will be, will be inspired to groom them. Now, of course, so you have this with animals. It also was observed that this kind of thing also goes on with birds. It goes on with animals. And they have what they call the courtship patterns. So for example, the robin wants to see another red robin, it believes it's male and it becomes aggressive. If the robin is a male and it's not red in color, it doesn't have his aggression. If a robin is stuffed and he has red, he has the same aggression. So the, the, the robins are, are patterned to behave in certain ways once they see this symbolic red robin. They know that it's in their territory, they know it's either they are females and then they get aggressive. Fishes, animals, the studies of animals with fixed action patterns are endless. And, and, and interestingly, human beings, you know, have the tendency to look at this and feel, oh, wow, animals. Uh, but un, unknown to us, as human beings, we also have our own stereotypes. We also have our own fixed action patterns. Uh, and of course, yeah, it's just basically saying that human beings are not completely rational in their decision making. Uh, and increasingly, as the world progresses and we are inundated by more and more information, the less likely we are likely going to consult all the data and all the details of the information before we make decisions. We're going to make impulsive decisions. We're going to make trigger-based decisions. And guess what? Those things were placed there so that they can be used. But interestingly, anybody who understands your trigger can also get to achieve more results with you because these triggers are there. And they are, they are like stereotypes. You know, they, they, There was a story that was shared in the book that I found interesting of somebody who had a shop had some clothes materials that she had had in the, uh, she had in the shop material shop for a while and he had not sold. And on this particular time, he decided to take a trip. And in taking the trip, he wrote a note for the, she wrote, she, I think it was a she. She wrote a note for the person who was attending to the shop and said, please, for this particular material, sell at half price. Uh, but interestingly, the person who, uh, who saw it did not know, did not read the sign correctly. She felt... He felt that he meant, or she felt she meant sell at times two. So the divided by two looked to her like times two, and she put double the price there. And the person who gave the did not know. By the time that person who gave the came back, <laughs> to her greatest surprise, she discovered that the cloth had completely sold out at double the price, not half the price. And she was shocked. How come when it was this price, people were not buying it. Suddenly doubles and it finishes quickly. What's going on? And then he calls to Kiyadini and Robert Kiyadini says, well, what happens? I need to explain it to you from the talkie chip, chip, chip. It's the same thing. People are wired to believe that expensive means more valuable. People are wired to believe that if it is higher in price, it's probably a better product. And what happened in that shop at that, that week was that this cloth material selling double the price Began already basically just gained value in the eyes of the who wanted to buy them, uh, and they bought it all completely. Why? Because all through people's lives, there's this wiring, there's this fixation pattern that has been developed in our subconscious that value is price, and if it's pricey, it's because it's valuable. Now, so humans have their stereotypes, humans have the things that they're not paying attention to that can influence them. And in the world of influence, I'd like to talk about two of them as a preamble to our discussion about today's rule, today's law. And one is what is called favor and reason. Uh, it's a stereotype that says people want to know why. Okay, that you are likely going to be able to more, be more influential with people if you give them a reason. Okay, so 
Uh, the key exercise I was used to test this was a photocopy machine and a long line. So people are at this photocopy machine waiting to photocopy. And then lady goes across the line and says, please, can I, can I step in front of you? Now, it was shown that the results were less when they went out and asked people, can I step in front of you? And it was realized that the results were higher when they went and said, please, can I step in front of you? Because I have this problem, this problem, this problem, and I would really like to photocopy mine quickly. Now, uh, this puzzled the scientists who did the research and they said, look, is it because of the genuineness of the reason or because there was a reason? So they decided to do the experiment again and give reasons that don't make any sense. And interestingly, they are similar results. What was this to say? It says that human beings are likely to succumb or give you a concession to your desires if you give them a reason. They are more likely, more prone to respond if you give them a because. That the word because is a trigger that allows people to comply more. Uh, that's interesting, isn't it? So you have uh, favor and reason. Another very interesting concept that was observed as the open of influence for human beings is what they call the contrast principle or the power of preceding events, meaning that people are more likely to buy an idea after another idea. People are more likely to agree to do something after you have told them something more difficult to do that they refuse to do. Okay, so we realize that one of the very key elements as well is the law of contrast. And you must have seen this at work in various dimensions of your life as well. And typically, you find this kind of things at work uh, in scenarios where let's so that we don't disturb each other. Uh, thank you very much. So, in scenarios where um, people, you know, so if I tell you, for example, if I tell you, I would like you to. Uh, do something for me. Uh, I'd like you to give to, to loan me a million naira. Um, I'm really broke. I really have challenges. I have this. I have this. I have this. I have this. And I, and I lay it on you. Uh, this research says that you don't have a million naira, so you won't give me. Uh, if I ask you for fifty thousand naira directly, you don't have fifty thousand naira, you know, so you won't give me. But if I ask you for a million naira first. And then after asking you for a million naira, I go right ahead and ask you, and ask you for uh, fifty thousand naira. This research shows that you are more likely, you are more than likely to respond positively to my request of fifty thousand naira after you have refused my re request of one million. So it says that the preceding events, uh, or the contrast between the preceding event and the current event, creates a sufficient trigger to influence someone. Uh, somebody wants to buy, sell you a house. It takes you to a horrible house, very horrible house for a very high price. And then you don't like the house, you don't like the price, but immediately that happens, the next one you go to is a little bit more in your price range, it's a little bit more decent. It's not perfect, but on the account of the one you just saw, you are more prone to say yes because of the contrast principle. And this is a trigger that works for human beings. It's theory that also human beings. So it says, this law or this concept says people are more likely to say yes when they you have shown them something that is higher that they have said no to. This is the contrast principle. Now, these are weapons of influence. And what it says is with influence, human beings are not logical. If you understand the rule and you play the rules and you play by the rules, you will get more uh, response to the things you demand. If also, this is as a user, also as somebody who it is used on, you are more armed to be able to say no to the things you should say no to if you also understand these laws. So these laws are not only for the attack, they are also for the defense. Uh, for those who are doing using it for attack, I'd like to make a cautionary note at this point in this class that I am an ethical person. I like to teach things that will be used for ethical purposes. So many times people don't know what is good for them. They don't know what they want or what they should have. So it's good to, to use to influence them. So you influence your children to read the Bible. You influence your children to go to school. You influence your friends to do the right things. You, you, well, well, it, life is all about a game of influence. Now, ethically, ethical influence is, I don't want to influence somebody to put their hand in fire. I don't want to put, influence somebody to get themselves into trouble. I want to use influence appropriately so that people can develop it and grow and they can accomplish the things that are important to them in life by virtue of that influence. So while, whereas this can be used very, you know, in, in very scary ways, it is best that it is used well for the upliftment of mankind, for the betterment of other people. So I just said I should chip that in uh, so that everything we're doing here is ecological. Uh, we want to teach 
ethical principles that you can use to influence people in positive directions for business, for growth, for things that will help them do better. So, uh, for example, when I asked my wife out, I asked my wife out because I felt it was a good thing for her to marry me. It was good for me. It was also good for her. Okay. And she probably might not have seen it was a good idea. So I needed to influence her. So that's what influence is. Influence is about uh, getting someone to be able to do something that is good for them that they may not have been able to do otherwise. So this is about ecology. It's about being ethical. Uh, this is not about using it to, you know, get 50 girlfriends or get 20 girlfriends or have many people that you are, you know, um, taking advantage of. So today we're going to be talking about the first uh, concept today. Uh, the first rule today is the law of reciprocity. And this is a golden rule. It's a rule that all of us is universal. Uh, that says do to others what you expect them to do to you. Um, for as long as the earth remains, uh, sea time and harvest will not cease. Uh, that means, for example, in this world, we live in a space where people are, you know, are going to play by this rule. This rule is a very strong rule that operates in society. And so very quickly, I'll define the rule. Like I said, the template, the law, uh, case studies, and then together we'll talk about practical application. So what exactly is this law? This law says people are obliged to give back to others the form of a behavior, gift, or service that they have received first. Okay? People are obliged to give back to others the form of behavior, gifts or service that they have received first. People are very likely to want to give back what they have received from you. Uh, somebody sent a message. I'd like to know what that is. Okay, the person said, I'm ready. Okay, that's good. So um, this law says, if I give you something, there's an obligation. Okay, giving creates an obligation uh, that makes you want to do, to give back. And I'm sure all of us have felt that before. Somebody invites you for a wedding, you want to, you know, you want to invite them for your children's own, for your child's own as well. Somebody invites you for their birthday, you feel compelled to invite them for them for your birthday as well. Somebody does something nice to you, you carry a burden of indebtedness to them. When they make a call for it one day, or an opportunity presents itself for you to do good back to the person that has done good to you, you will not hesitate to do it. You will do the good. Okay. Uh, it says our obligation is not our obligation is not dependent on whether we like the favor, the request. Uh uh, request the favor or even welcome the favor. Now, this is scary, okay? And what this principle is, or this law is saying is, whether you like what was given to you or not, okay, is immaterial. This law works. This law works whether you like what you are given or you don't. So our obligation is not dependent on whether we like the favor, request the favor, or welcome the favor. You may have even rejected the favor. You may find it irritating and unwelcoming. It still confers the obligation. And of course, the last thing, the last dimension of this law says, it enforces uninvited debts. So once I get the gift, I didn't invite it, I'm in debt. It triggers unfair exchanges. It means if I get a gift of one naira, I may feel compelled to pay back the thousand naira. Yeah, the exchanges are unfair and it compels them, it triggers them. It makes us respond positively, even when we're given as a concession. So you don't think I have to say, I don't have money, I cannot give anybody anything. Nope, you can give. You can give a concession. That even if all you give is a concession, it makes people respond and behave properly, okay? They respond positively. One set in motion, reciprocity does not need to be invited or the exchange equal. Reciprocity works whether it is, you know, it's unfair exchanges, indebtedness, even if what you give is a concession. By, for example, the concession I mean, I asked you for something, you said no to me. I can receive that no in good faith and it becomes a gift that I've given you. That when I receive your no, I have given you a concession. And that giving you a concession already mandates and gives you an obligation to not want to hurt me the next time and be nice to me. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> these are very important things uh, that some people do naturally, uh, uh, but they cannot repeat it again because it's not a law that they've known. But you, if you learn this, master this, you can do this again. And you can do this again and again and again because uh, you understand it. So, how does this war, law work? What are the essentials of uh, the case studies that we can see on the laws of reciprocity? And I'm going to share a few of them. As I'm sharing them, please think through about your life, about your business, about your career, about your marriage, about your children, about your colleagues, and ask, how can I implement this in practice? How can I in, pra in practice? How can I do this in my life? How can I use this law of influence to achieve better results with people, better results with marketing, better results for my business. How can I use this? And I'm going to give you the different angles. I've tried to identify the ones I feel are the best ones. 
uh, that show different things from different angles so that you can easily pattern your pattern that they might. Listen, in this class, your contribution can score you marks. So it's good that you contribute when the time comes. As well as, so the first one is the power of means. Uh, and this one about the power of means is about, it's quite, quite an interesting one. Uh, this research was done in the restaurants where people give tips. And they realized that the giving of tips grew based on some parameters. So they realized that people normally give tips, but they give about more than 10% more when a tip was given. So if you give somebody one uh, mint and, and you thank them for coming, they're likely to give you more tip than they would have given you before. If you make it two mints, research shows uh, your tip more than doubles. Okay, so you, the increase, oh, sorry, the increase in your tip more than doubles. So you can expect like 26% or thereabouts increase in your tip for doubling the suits. And the very interesting part is, uh, they said if there's a methodology you're giving the gifts as well, say for example, you give them their bill, you give them a means, and as you are going, you realize, oh, you know what, uh, for you very, really nice people, here's another means. Thank you for coming, you know, th you know thank you for patronizing us. But that element of surprise, that element of impulsiveness, that element of I'm giving you this, this tip, you know, in the spur of the moment, allows your tip to increase significantly. So that it's not only how you wield the gift, it's not only how you give the gift, how you give the gift is important into how much value you're going to get in return. So one, we realize that gifts are important. When you're generous with your gifts, you achieve significant results. And guess what? When you give it strategically, you can even get a lot more done. Uh, another case study we have is the Amway box. Amway is a network marketing company in America. They are like one of the forerunners in the industry. The Amway is like short for American way. Uh, is the American way of doing business. It's uh, saying that network marketing is the American way. It's basically a way of living your dreams. Now, Amway decided to launch a give away system called Box. And what they do is basically have a few samples of their products uh, packaged in a small handbag or nylon bag or small bag. Uh, a few of the products that they give to somebody who is a prospective customer, they give person free and say, please, it says to the person, please try these products, use them, don't worry about them, use as many as you want to use. Uh, after you have used them, uh, I'm going to come back in three to five days to find out how you enjoy the products, if you, which one products you like, uh, and then let me know then, you know, if there's something that interests you. Now, of course, they give this to people and they tried this out and they witnessed amazing results. So they realized that they were able to achieve phenomenal things by doing this. Uh, they achieved phenomenal, really phenomenal things by doing this. Uh, and they were able to do that, you know, with this, they realized by giving something away, there was an obligation. Everybody that they gave it to, almost everybody decided to patronize them and buy. Everybody decided to get involved in their business one way or the other. It was amazing. Okay? And because it was amazing this way, um, you know, it was, it was something that allowed them to be able to achieve a lot more results. And people paid. Of course, the ones that they are used, they are not used everything. So they, out of like 10 items, they used like two. They had to buy, they bought. And then the remaining eight could easily be packed together, see what was used and give it to the next, next family to try it out as well. So that's how the Amway box worked, okay? It was a gift, it created indebtedness, it grew their business. And that case that I'd like to share is the Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Society. And this is a very interesting one because this is where you find that the gift that you give does not need to be wanted. People don't need to welcome it or like it before it forces the indebtedness or the obligation on them. Uh, the Hare Krishna Society, why society that not, were not very popular in America, it was a religious organization, but they went around the airports and places where people could be found, giving away flowers and asking immediately for donations. And people didn't want the flowers. People resisted the flowers. People understood what was being done. They didn't want to be a part of it, but guess what? The moment you collected the flowers, the obligation to pay, uh, somebody did a video recording to see how this works and they realized people paid. They didn't like the gifts they paid. They reluctantly accepted the gifts they paid. They refused the gift like three times that it was forced in their hands they still paid. And guess what? The very interesting part about this was uh, a few minutes away from where they collected the flowers, they were dustbins, uh, that it, they, the majority of them simply placed the flowers back in the dustbins. And this Irish Christian society went back to the dustbins, picked the flowers again and gave it out without even having to buy new flowers. Uh, the gifts are not wanted, but it's still created effect. They're collecting their own offering, basically by giving people flowers and demanding for a donation. And it worked for them. It looks kind of very funny, but it works. Whether the gift is wanted or not, people feel obligated to give back once they've collected the gift. 
Another one that was done, another research that looked very interesting is the Reagan, Reagan studies. And the Reagan study was, was, was done with a guy called Joe. And Joe was in a room uh, and they did a lot of experiments with Joe. So Joe was selling raffle tickets. Uh, but Joe will invite you to a room. You will sit down. Joe will go out, get a bottle of Coke for you. Um, and then he'll give you a bottle of Coke. And uh, after you are started drinking your bottle of Coke, Joe lets you know that he's selling raffle tickets and he would like you to buy one at XYZ, XYZ, explain the raffle tickets. And guess what? It was realized that when they didn't get Coke, they had a particular result that wasn't phenomenal. When they got this bottle of Coke and drank this bottle of Coke, the results shot up significantly. Significantly. And they were like, wow, just a gift of Coke did this. And guess what? Uh, the raffle tickets were selling for about five times the price of the Coke. So it wasn't an unfair, it wasn't an, it wasn't a fair exchange as well. It triggered an unfair exchange. Um, they did the research to find out, did they like Joe before? Did they like Joe after? Were they people who liked Joe normally? And the result shows that it didn't matter whether they liked Joe or not. They got the same result. Whether they liked Joe or not, increase in uh, purchase of raffle tickets. The average person did about two tickets. Uh, one ticket is five times the price of Coca-Cola. So it made a very big ROI on this study. But it shows basically that when you settle down with people and give them a gift, uh, you are likely to achieve a lot more with them because of what the law of reciprocity says. The law of reciprocity says the gift doesn't need to be wanted. The person who gives sets in motion a sequence of responses that will always pay them. Like we say in our language, the hand of the giver always stays up. He that gives up, he that gives to others can never, you know, can never be down. Um, you know, you always prosper when you give. So the same concepts uh, you know, that was studied with Joe, with the, with the Reagan study, uh, with Joe and the raffle tickets, people responded positively. And of course, there's a very interesting concept also of giving, uh, particularly for people who feel, okay, uh, I don't have much to give. What can I give? You can give a concession, okay? It's called the rejection retreat technique. Uh, what does this mean? This means, for example, that if you meet, so I, use, I use a very popular example that would be difficult to forget. So um, if my purpose is, it also works a little bit with, com, with contrast. You know, it, it plays with the principle of contrast. So if I go to someone and I say, please, I would like to share my business opportunity with you. Uh, this is what this is. This is what this, this is good for anybody who wants to do H, A, B, C, D, E. And I do all of that work. And the person tells me, nope, I'm not interested. If I say, okay, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that you're not interested. It must mean that this is not something that interests you at this moment. And he says, yes. I say, okay, good, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I don't want to take your time or stress you. But please, can you give me the names of two of your friends who are about in the space where this can make a little sense to them? You know, we really want to help people succeed. We really want to do this. Do you have two people you can give me? Don't worry. I'll go and meet them myself. I'll do all the work myself. I just feel if it's not okay for you, you might at least know someone. Now, if I ask that question first, it's not likely to answer me. But now that I've asked him something, he has told me no, and I've accepted his no politely, I have accepted his concession, I'm more likely to get a result when I ask him for the next thing. Okay, it's called rejection retreat technique. It also plays with the concept of contrast. So if I come to meet you and I say to you, please uh, loan me 10,000 naira, um, I really will appreciate it. I need to sort something out. And you say, well, I don't really have much cash with me. You say, you know what? You know what? If you can give me 2,000 naira, it will help. Okay? Don't give me everything. 2,000 naira will help. I'm more likely to get my 2,000 naira because I considered. So you're not giving me 10,000 naira. Okay? So the principle of uh, the law here, or the concept here says, by giving somebody a concession, I am also armed uh, to be able to get that same obligation from that person to do more for me. So there's a network marketing company that tells people, go out, ask them, let them tell you no, but let them give you the list of their friends. Let them give you the list of their friends. Um, so it's a strategy. It can be a strategy that you will use to say, you know what, uh, if I get rejected, I can, you know, play something heavy before so that I can get rejected and I can use that concession to get uh, some value. And you see this all the time. Um, leveraging on the contrast principle, the recession is not very visible. Yeah? But the achieves result. An example of that you find with the billiard board. A uh, company was selling billiard boards and they had the billiard boards that cost $500 and they had billiard boards that cost $3,000. And in week one, they said, show them the cheap one and then the expensive one. And week two, they said, show them the expensive one and then the cheap one. And guess what? They achieved more results in phase two because of rejection retreat technique. They got more results also because of the contrast principle because once it is bigger before and it's less now, 
I am more attuned to that less now uh, than if you presented it to me as the first thing. And of course, they saw this also with people who are asked to donate blood. Uh, they realized that they called a group of young children together and say, you know what, or young people together and say, you know what, we want to go to the hospitals. We like to do this every week for the next 24 weeks. Go there, you know, take some blood and give us those who need. And everybody was like, what, what was that? I say, okay, well, well, is that too much for you? Okay, here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do is let's just go one day. Okay, is that fine? Everybody says, yeah, that's fine. And over 80% of them agreed to the one day plan. They went and guess what? After they had donated their blood, they said, will you do this again? They said, yes. So the fact that you had used influence to move them in that journey, got them to taste something that they would want to do more and more of, that's the concept of uh, reciprocity. So reciprocity says, uh, once you give something to someone, there's an obligation. Okay, that obligation, um, that obligation is, is, is huge. It wants to pay back. It wants to pay back more than the value of what uh, was requested. That obligation wants to, you know, ensure that the person uh, maximizes uh, the opportunity to pay you back. So what are the things we can do with this practically? I'm going to give you a few examples, okay? And then you will tell me a few things. I'm going to undo the mic shortly. But before I do that, let me share a few of the practical examples I have in stock with you today. And based on those practical examples, we can now hear yours. So number one, package gifts uh, for influential prospects. Uh, we've been doing this. We call it kegs. Uh, and the full meaning of kegs, I think, is key experience gift. So it's a key experience gift. I give it out to people so that they can experience my opportunity. Uh, with us in Green Monday, we can use the 250, uh, 30 mils um, reader. We can use the, the balm. Uh, you may want to even use this again for some people. Anything that you can package to people, the bigger the gift, the more exciting. If the gift is small, it doesn't matter. Remember, it triggers unwanted debts. It triggers unfair exchanges. You know, so start small. Uh, but how the gift is given is also important. So package it neatly, package it well, give it out, tell them you're going to check it three to five days to find out how they're using the product and how they feel with the product. They can give a cake. Number two, uh, gifts for donations. If you have an NGO that you're running, you can give them gifts and ask them to donate. It works. With Ari Krishna, it will work, particularly if the NGO you're driving is one that is helpful, useful, and helps to make a difference. Uh, also, I think the Coca-Cola for raffle is something we can do for our invites to events. I think it's also something we can do uh, even for our business. You want to have a prospect meeting? Why entertain? Why not entertain? You know? Uh, why not be free with people? Don't let your hand be a can be. Okay? Release. Uh, the more you give, the more you have the capacity to receive. Um, and I think we've seen that the law works, so why don't we work it? Okay? Another example is entertain prospects. And when you're closing one-on-one, -on -one, invite them for a meeting, invite them for a lunch, ensure that, you know, um, they are doing something uh, you're doing something that allows you to give to them and, and keep them a bit indebted. Uh, it's easier for people to flow where they feel, you know, I, I owe you something, uh, you have done something for me, you know, and I would like to pay back. So entertain them, give out gifts, that works. Uh, also, from what you can see from the contrast principle, many of us who have been doing our seminars and selling bronze packs, we are guilty here, okay? You don't sell bronze packs. Uh, if you sell bronze packs and they say no to bronze packs, what else are you going to get? Okay, what's the contrast? You know, so just like the person who takes you to a house, uh, shows you a house, you know, and tells you you don't like the house, the house is expensive, uh, or you like the house. This are that strategy. You like the house, but the house costs four million per annum. Or you like the house. And the person took you there, not because that's the house. They took you there so that they can get you to up your budget. So you go there and they say, look, this house is nice, but you know, they're all expensive. And then the guy says, so, well, sir, what's your budget? What's your budget? And then you say, well, my budget, you say my budget is by yourself. You will change your budget because they show you something more expensive than the value you're about to pay. So even you by yourself, you begin to advise yourself and tell yourself, well, uh, I can do 2 million, 2 million. Meanwhile, before you saw that first house, your budget was 1 million. But now that they've given you contrast, you are able to up your budget because you have seen something more expensive and you're able to say, okay, you know what, I can do more uh, if I find something like this that I like. The same way, when we're selling our Green Monday business, don't sell the small pack, sell the big pack. Sell the biggest pack and let the person aspire for the big pack. And if they can't afford the big pack, then you can let them know, you know what, I can step you to something lower. Uh, if you're interested, 
I can see a way I can make this work for you. And guess what? You can get them into silver, get them into stockist, get them to do business at a level of 300,000 naira, 400,000 naira, only because you use the law of contrast to show them something very exciting first. And then law of reciprocity, remember, you give, and then it, it comes back to you in return. And of course, one of the things we also need to learn to do is follow up after rejection. So if somebody rejects your offer, they've given you a concession. Uh, I think this is a very powerful tool uh, for people who are trying to date and ask the lady out. You know, you can become fantastic friends with someone. Uh, and in order to start out the friendship, you can ask for marriage. And if that doesn't work, and you agree it doesn't work, you know, you can stay at friendship. So you still get the friendship. I want to teach you back things. Okay, but you can follow up on rejection for, for your prospects. Uh, you can, if they say no to you, can I get more lists? Can I get people that I can talk to? You can take a spring off from your rejections as you accept concession. As you give concession, you, you, you are positioned the way you have given something. You can expect a lot more in return as well. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have rushed it. I'm sure if you listen to it again, uh, it gets clearer. The more you look, the more you see. Uh, so tonight, I'd like us to open our voices and uh, share with me what practical applications you think you will be able to apply with what you have learned. Now, I'm going to make sure that this session as well is recorded but recorded separately. So I'm going to end this course at this time here. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope this is useful to you. I'd like to see your comments on what you think already on how you think this can be utilized. And then I will open the floor